On behalf of Copeland Financial Ministries, I would like to welcome you to the Advanced Biblically Based Estate Planning Workshop Series. The presenter, Tom Copeland, is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ who has been called to teach God's Word on finances since 1982. Tom is a chartered professional accountant and the founder and president of Copeland Financial Ministries. Now, here's Tom teaching what the Bible says on estate planning. Okay, so this is session two. What's the first thing you do whenever you're trying to discern what God wants you to do in making any major financial decision or any major decision at all? What's the very first thing you do? Pray. Pray, exactly. And that shows up in every one of my slides, every workshop I do. So you start off praying. I like what Josephat said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. That's where we need to go to first. Often Christians don't do that. Often what Christians do is they make financial decisions based upon their own personal desires or their own limited knowledge and later ask God to bail them out of, out of the mistakes they made. With your estate plan, once you've done it, once you put it in your will, and if there's problems after you die, you can't change it. It's, it's done. So it's so important in, in this area, especially to do, to do planning. Who then is the man who fears the Lord? God will instruct him in the way chosen for him. Bottom line is God's promise to direct us as we look for his uh, wisdom and direction. Uh, the next thing I recommend, study what God's word says on finances in general and in estate planning in particular. You're going to see as we go through this workshop series, the Bible has a lot to say on estate planning, way more than most people. If you talk to most Christians, they think, I don't think it has anything to say. It's got a lot to say. A lot of scriptures that apply to estate planning. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I love Psalms 119, 105. I find that as a, if, if you're trying to make a decision on your estate plan and you're not sure, just go back through these materials, look at the scriptures that apply to estate planning, pray about it, and if you read 20 or 30 scriptures and two or three are highlighted and the Spirit of God just talks to you, you know that God's, God, that's how the Lord can highlight his word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and light to my path. That's how God can give you very specific direction because many times in estate planning, there is no simple answers. However, I would say this, lots of Christians violate the biblical principles because they don't know what they are. But once you know what the biblical principle are, prim principles are, then there can be several answers, several options within the biblical guidelines. Seek godly counsel throughout the, the uh, process. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. If you feel led by the Lord to give a portion of your, your estate to God's work, a non-believer isn't going to understand that. They're not going to relate to it. And I've even seen real-life cases, and they shouldn't do this, but it doesn't happen often where lawyers will talk people out of giving a portion to their church or whatever. So if you want uh, biblically-based financial advice, you've got to go to someone that, uh, that has the Spirit of God that, and, but also knows God's Word on finances and as it relates to um, estate planning. Unfortunately, many times, even Christians who are financial advisors or accountants or whatever their name is, often, uh, whatever they're involved in, often they don't understand what the Bible says on finances and they just give advice based upon their, their secular training. So um, develop a close relationship with the Lord so you can recognize God's voice. Remember in 1 Kings 19, God spoke to Elijah through a gentle whisper. And if we don't spend the time praying and asking God to speak to us and then listening, taking the time to listen, you're not going to be able to discern exactly what God wants you to do. But if you spend the time, God will show you what to do. And we'll talk more about discerning God's specific will in complex situations. And I'm sure there's lots of cases here where there are people who are in complex situations. And be sure to obtain God's peace before you make any major financial decision. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So make sure you experience the Lord's peace. I'm going to talk today specifically about trusts and annuities. Some of you may have never heard of these terms before. I want to encourage you. They're not that complicated. Conceptually, they're simple. You don't need to know how to incorporate and write up a trust into your will or in include an annuity. A lawyer, an experienced estate lawyer can do that for you. You just need to give them the instructions as to what you want, uh, what you feel led by the Lord to do with the money God's entrusted to you. These trusts and annuities can be used very effectively in, a state, in developing an estate plan, especially where one of your beneficiaries could be an adult child or whatever. If one of them mismanaged money and they're in, or they're incapable of managing money, maybe there's a, a disability of some kind, then, then these things can, or you could have a child that is just simply too young to manage money. These trusts and annuities can be very, very effective in, in putting together an estate plan. 
A trust can be set up pursuant to your will, it's incorporated in your will, and you can provide instructions to the executor to purchase an annuity for a beneficiary. Sometimes a trust is the best thing, sometimes an annuity is the best thing. I'll explain uh, it with real life uh, practical examples in a few minutes. Uh, and an experienced estate lawyer can quite easily include this in, your, in, his will, in your will, but you need to give them instructions because normally they won't unless they're given specific instructions. Here's some key uh, terms or elements with respect to a will and a trust. The settlor is the individual providing the assets. In other words, you are the settlor for your will. Uh, you're the one that's going to be transferring the assets pursuant to your death. The beneficiaries are the individuals who uh, will receive the assets as per the instructions in your will. So it's very important to make sure your will is clear on who gets what. The executor or trustee of your will is the individual who's appointed to carry out your wishes as outlined in the will, including an allocation of assets to beneficiaries to purchase an annuity or hold money in trust for a beneficiary. So the executor, uh, the, the old term is executor, the more current term is estate trustee, but they're basically the same thing. They're often used interchangeably. I'll be using, the, often, I'll be using them interchangeably. But... Um, they're, they're, they're responsible to execute what you want in your will. The integrity of that person has to be impeccable because I've seen lots and lots of cases in the last 40 years where often what mom and dad put in their will does not get implemented. And unless there's a portion allocating to a charity and the will gets probated and the court notifies the charity, there's really no policing mechanism in our country to, to, uh, to basically make sure that the assets get allocated according to mom and dad's wishes. A trust... Sounds complicated, but it's not. It's simply a legal arrangement. It's generally created in your will, whereby the funds for a specific beneficiary are not distributed immediately. And, um, and then the trustee decides when and how the funds will be distributed for the benef benefit of the beneficiary. This could be really effective if you've got an adult child that squanders money. Because what I find, I'll tell you one thing. If your kids squander money, squander their money, when after you die and they get your money, they're going to squander it as well. It's the mindset, it's the thinking. Jesus said whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And, uh, and if they're not trustworthy with a small amount, they won't be trustworthy with a large amount. And you can also even consider, based on parable, the parable of the talents, you might actually give less to the kid who's the bad money manager. That's actually consistent with Scripture. And you should actually tell them that beforehand because it can be a wake-up call to give them an incentive to start to learn to manage money properly. And uh, the trust is an effective way to also meet um, uh, the needs of a disabled child or someone under um, 18, uh, 18 years of age. The executor of the will will generally become the trustee of the individual trust created under the will, uh, but that's not mandatory because it's possible to have uh, the executor who sort of is overseeing the will to be different than the, the, the uh, trustee that's taking care of each trust. You can have more than one trust on a will. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the trustee of a specific testamentary trust is responsible to follow the instructions provided in your will with respect to that trust. That's why it's important to have people of integrity. They're actually going to follow and go out. I think of a case in, a few years ago where a, a fellow in, in, in the will, mom, dad had died, mom had indicated she wanted a certain portion of the estate to go to the grandkids. They weren't Christians, so nothing went to the Lord's work, but uh, it never did go to the grandkids. The fellow and his wife split up. And he felt he's, what he was paying to his wife uh, as uh, alimony and child support was, was sufficient. Nobody to police it. There's no, there's no um, the government's not overseeing this. This is not being overseen. And of course, the grandkids don't know. And the ex-wife doesn't know either. So no one else knows. I gave him the advice, what I thought, but he, I don't think he ever followed up. And you can't have more than one trust arising from your will because you can have different situations. You can have one adult child that squanders money and you want to put that in trust to see that it's used wisely. You can have another adult child, let's say, that works full-time in ministry and sometimes their, uh, their support is down and you may want to set that aside in a trust and have, um, the, give the, uh, the trustee direction to, to basically contribute to the son or daughter's ministry for their support as it's needed. Um, you can also do a lump sum to the ministry if you like, but sometimes it can just be a bit safer to do it through a trust. So, uh, because the, the child may, may change ministries, or they may, you know, they may not continue in, in ministry uh, long term. Guardians, if your kids are under 18 years of age, it's extremely important to appoint a guardian in your will for your kids in case both you and your spouse died. If you don't prepare a will and you don't designate a guardian for your kids, then the government will decide. And um, let me talk about that for a minute. In the last 40 years, I've seen so many cases 
Or I speak to a young couple and they got little kids and they don't even have a will. That is so dangerous. I can't tell you how dangerous that is. The government will decide who's going to bring your kids up if you both die. Now, if one spouse dies in Ontario, that's fine. It, it, the, the, the surviving spouse is, is automatically the guardian, in a sense, the parent. But if they both die, it's, it's, it also creates a lot of chaos because who's going to look after my kids? And sometimes another relative will step up to the plate and help out for a season, but the court can decide on something else. They may even put them into a foster home or something. So you really need to, if, you, if, you're, if you've got kids under 18 years of age, you really need to have a will and for sure um, designate who your guardians are going to be for your kids and, and pick people, pick the appropriate people. Let's talk about this estate, um, this, this case study, which will uh, answer, go further on, on uh, Lorna's question. Norman and Sue are both committed Christians. They're married and they have two young children. They're in the process of updating their wills and they need to make some key decisions. Norman and Sue feel led by the Lord to have Sue's sister, Jennifer, be the guardian of their children in case they both die before their kids attain 18 years of age. Jennifer is a great mother to her kids, a committed Christian who is teaching her kids God's way of living, but unfortunately Jennifer is a poor money manager. Norman's friend Ron is an excellent money manager, having a thorough understanding of God's word on finances. However, Ron does not feel led by the Lord to assume the responsibility of guardianship. However, he is willing to serve as the executor of their wills and the trustee of the trust created under their will. So what do you, what do you think, um, what biblically based estate planning advice would you give to Norman and Sue with respect to updating their wills? Um, just to start, uh, I can't remember where exactly, it's Proverbs uh, 20 or 22, train a child in the way he should go and um, when, when he's old, he'll not depart from that. Thanks, Donna. Um, so, I mean, g getting the guardian in place, um, I think, would be paramount before you do anything else. So, I'd, I'd encourage, uh, encourage them to look into Jennifer uh, to being the guardian. To start. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Jennifer is the guardian. Do we have a spot for Ron? Yeah, we do. Remember, Jen Jennifer's a great guardian, great mother, but she's not a good money manager. So here's, here's the answer. I think it's pretty straightforward. So um, choosing Jennifer as the, um, as the guardian, and Eli quoted that scripture, Proverbs 22, 6, is, I think, the best choice. With respect to the money management, it's best to choose someone, that is Ron, who understands and applies God's financial principles in, in managing money. So you're better to get the, you, you can have the guardianship, and you can have the money, the executor, or the trustee of the trust, they can be separate. They don't have to be the same person. Sometimes it can be difficult to find someone who is good at managing money and also good at uh, raising kids, or even is, is willing to raise the kids. Uh, we, we don't know the, I purposely didn't put in the, the details here on Ron, but Ron could be a single man. Maybe he doesn't, or maybe him and his wife have grown kids, they don't want to manage the money. They don't look after the kids. Uh, they're not set up for that, but he, he can look after the funds. So sometimes the guardians of your children and those who are going to take care of the estate, the executor or the trustee of the trust, they can be different. Now here's the next question. What if Ron was not willing to serve as a trustee of the trust, which would likely commit him up to the children are about 25 years of age, what's a practical biblical option? Say he's willing to be the executor but not the trustee of the trust. And let me, let me just sort of tell you what I had in mind here. For this couple, um, often what you need to do is create a trust for your kids to provide for their needs up to age 25. And by then they should be through school and also provide for their education. They should be through school, they should be working full time, and should be in their, on, their, on their own. Mom and dad, you don't have to look after your kids for the rest of their lives. I mean, that can create a lot of laziness and everything else. But certainly getting them through school, getting them educated, especially in this country where uh, lots of people have got post-secondary degrees, um, that's, that's really important. So often with kids, the trust is set up and, or the annuity is set up until they're about age 25 years of age, give or take. So now let's say he doesn't want to serve as the trustee because maybe the kids is, maybe the youngest is two years of age. That's 24 years of a commitment, sorry, 23. So what, what, what do you think could be an option here? Any idea? Go ahead, Ed. What I'm saying is... Um the wrong can the option or have the option to buy annuities in annuities, order to, yeah. you know, to give them uh, to give Jennifer some money in yeah. advance and avoid that she spends the whole money for these kids mm -hmm. yep. until they reach okay. the age of 25. Excellent, that's an excellent answer. What he was saying is, if, let's say Ron doesn't want that 23-year commitment. 
but he's willing to be the executor. You can all, he can always buy an annuity that lasts until age 25 for the kids, and that money can go to Gen Jennifer to look after the kids. It's designated to go for the kids. That way, you see, someone that's a poor money manager, if they get access to a lot of money, and even though it's supposed to last 23 years, the odds are it'll be gone in five or 10 years. That's what'll happen. And then that'll become a problem for Jennifer and, and her husband as well, a real stress. So it, the annuity basically spreads it out over a long period of time, and there's income earned uh, within that annuity. So um, I'm going to talk about a testamentary trust versus an intervivalist trust. Again, these concepts are simple. Don't let the, the terms scare you. When someone dies and they leave a beneficiary, they leave money to a beneficiary pursuant to their will, that's called a testamentary trust, okay? Uh, when someone dies, they leave money to a beneficiary pursuant to their will, it's a testamentary trust. However, an individual can set up what's called an intervivalist trust. The word intervivalist literally means uh, while, while living, while living. They can set up an intervivalist trust. The definitions above in respect to settler, beneficiary, and trustee are, are the same for both. Intervivalist trusts are not used very often because most people are not aware of them, but they can be really effective in some situations, really effective. However, um, an alter ego trust is, is just a type of intervivalist trust, but it can only be utilized if the settler is at least 65 years of age. But it has a big advantage that it avoids triggering any capital gains when you transfer the assets in. See, often when someone's looking at a let me, I, I'll get into tax law in more detail later, but someone's looking at an intervivalist trust. If you transfer, say, appreciated stocks or mutual funds or something like that into the trust, there's a deemed sale at fair market value. There's a capital gain in, in Canadian law. Uh, with an alter ego trust, as long as the set law, the transfer or, is at least 65 years of age, there is no deemed capital gain. You avoid that. And uh, this thing can be very effective. You also avoid probate fees, as I mentioned at the bottom. Okay, here's the situation. Mother's dad died. A dad is uh, cognitive most of the time, but not always. And if you haven't run into this situation yet, or if you haven't had a friend run into this situation, I'll tell you, what I'm about to describe to you is really common. I've seen it a lot in the last 40 years. It's really sad, but it's really, really common. So dad is 85 years of age. His health is deteriorating. He's starting to struggle with dementia. A much younger woman, maybe 35, 40, 45 years, uh, it takes an interest in him, and he's growing to like her. Their adult kids are reasonably concerned that this young woman's motives may be very selfish, and she may very well take advantage of her father. As long as dad is willing, it can make a lot of sense for dad to transfer his assets to an alter ego trust, because he's over 65, there's no capital gain on the transfer, and let's assume he's got some mutual funds or some stocks or something that he can transfer in. Obviously, you got no assets, there's no need to do a trust, but most people, as they get up there, do have some assets. And under that alter ego trust, he would be the sole beneficiary during his lifetime, and after he dies, his two children and the Lord's work would be the beneficiaries. That's how the trust is set up. It almost, in a sense, takes, doesn't quite take place of his will, but it, 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 it handles a big chunk of the assets when, when he passes on. To protect the uh, family assets, Dad and his two children would be the trustees. So if the younger woman got dad to sign a new will, it would only govern the assets outside of the trust. Assets, uh, that's all it would govern. And typically the only asset that we cannot transfer into a trust is a retirement income fund, registered retirement income fund. And that can be dealt with by designating um, the beneficiaries of the registered retirement income fund as the children in the Lord's work. So this, this is um, something that can be very effective. My conclusion, be careful of gold diggers. I thought gold diggers was a slang term, but it's actually defined in the dictionary, typically as a younger woman, although it can be a younger man, taking an interest in an older, uh, using a younger woman, taking an interest in an older man, and her motive is to get his money. And Paul said, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced himself with many griefs. If your parent, by the way, is not willing to cooperate, with this, if you can get their cooperation on this, it, it can really, that's the easiest way to do it. But if they won't cooperate, there are other ways to, to, to deal with it, especially if it looks like the gold digger is getting quite aggressive. One option, you, you can consider obtaining legal advice, medical advice. It may be necessary to get your parents assessed by a qualified practitioner under the Substitutions Act, that's an Ontario law. And, uh, and if they're assessed as incapable of managing their affairs, then any 
new power of attorney or any will that this uh, younger woman gets him to sign, any new thing like that will be null and void. If she's really aggressive, consider getting a responsible adult child to uh, be appointed by the Superior Court of Ontario as a guardian. Then it's conclusive. This, you may, some of you may have never seen this, but I'll tell you, it's happening. And I go to, when I talk to people in nursing homes, it, it, it's happening. I personally was appointed this uh, guardian of the Superior Court of Ontario by an elderly, uh, in respect of an elderly gentleman. If I didn't step in, this younger woman would have got all his assets. And his one daughter who was disabled uh, and another daughter, they wouldn't have got anything. And so I felt led by the Lord to step in and get involved. I, believe me, I don't do that as a policy because it's a lot of work. But uh, I did get involved. Also, contractors and certain salespeople can take advantage of the elderly. So take some precautions to protect your aging parents. Um, and if you're aging, even get your kids to help protect you. For example, maybe you should have control of their checkbook or something like that. I got a call a couple of years ago from a detective with uh, the York Regional Police. And what he was calling me about is an elderly gentleman who had been ripped off by a few contractors. Like, I mean really ripped off. He was paying ten grand for stuff that the detective looked at and estimated it was worth about 500 bucks. And they were going throughout Thornhill and Richmond Hill and ripping these elderly people off. And um, I, I helped them as much as I could with the documentation I had. But it was just amazing. They got a whole, this guy's full-time job, that's what it is, to protect the elderly. And, and, and people like these the contractors and, and sometimes gold diggers from, from ripping off the elderly. That could happen to you. It could happen to me when we get older. Or it can, can happen especially to your parents. So here's a question. What if you've been appointed as an executor of an estate and you sense that the liabilities could be greater than the assets? Uh, and because of easy credit, there's many situations where parents or other relatives die and they leave a financial mess, liabilities greater than the assets. And as I mentioned last week, one of the worst things you can do is leave a pile of debt to your kids. The best thing you can do is pay off all your debts, actually pay them all off well before you retire, and don't have a lot of debt after you, after you retire. It can create all kinds of problems for your, for your kids. Okay, even if you've been appointed as executor under a will, before you assume that responsibility, be sure to assess the financial situation of the estate. In other words, look at what are the assets, what are the liabilities. Reason, if the liabilities exceed the assets, it could be a financial mess and create all kinds of problems for you. And by the way, all because you are appointed as an executor under a will, it does not mean that you have to serve as an executor you can turn it down. Understand this, in Ontario law, you're not responsible for their liabilities if you're executor, but you are responsible for their income tax liability. And I'll talk about that more in a later session. And also, just as a practical matter, uh, the, the deceased is gone. Who are the creditors going to come after the deceased is gone? They're going to come after you if you're the executor. They're going to sue you. And so you need to get some legal advice. There are ways to provide protection, but that's beyond the course, beyond the extent of what I want to talk to. That's more of a legal thing. Now let's talk about disputes amongst your siblings after mom and dad have died. Unfortunately, there's often disputes. I see it all the time. I'd say 60, 70 percent of the time, there's disputes amongst the siblings, amongst the kids after mom and dad die. It occurs. It's really common. You and your spouse, if you're married or if you're single, do this as well. You can minimize the risk of those disputes if you plan your estate and prepare your will very carefully. Can you think of any ideas of minimizing the risk of disputes amongst your siblings after you die? One of the things that uh, my mother did was she had a meeting with us and she had a list of certain items that she felt were important, like the clock they were given when they were married, that each of these items went to different grandchildren. And she was quite detailed. Now this wasn't in her will, but she wrote it out and then after their death we made sure that we followed her wishes. Excellent, excellent. And that can be dealing with the sentimental stuff. Maybe not significant monetary value, but very significant sentimental value. Go ahead. I think Tom, your recommendation about the trusts and annuities it would be an excellent way to set that up so that um, uh, everything's organized beforehand, but I think as you've mentioned several times, and I think it is critical, is to have that meeting with your children so that they're aware ahead of time what's going to happen, yep. so that it isn't a surprise. Yep. Um, I, I've already realized, my wife and I have been talking, my daughter's uh, 19 and my son's turning 17 this year, we've realized that if something happened to the two of us, 
we would need to figure out what we're going to do with our house and where the kids would live. So those are all things that we hadn't really considered until I started taking the course. So thank you very much for uh, bringing these things to our attention. It's very important. Thank you. And I agree. You need to have that communication. You, by the way, again, you don't have to tell them the details. You don't have to say we got X dollars, da, 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 everybody's getting. You don't have to tell them how much assets you have because if you do, they're going to be knocking on your door asking for money, right? Thinking Because sometimes kids start to think that their parents' money is their money. And I said it last time, I'll say it again. The, 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 your money is not your kids' money. It's not even your money. It's God's money. You've got to do what God wants you to do with it. So, um, and kids can be trying to persuade you. These are really good answers. Here's what I had. Communicate to your heirs at a high level your decisions. Um, this was mentioned with respect to the allocation of your estate assets. Be sure to indicate you're allocating a portion of the Lord's work. So often, especially for the non-believers, if they see something in the estate that's allocated to the Lord's work, there's problems. I think of a parachurch organization where um, dad died and then the mother died, and she allocated a significant, pun significant chunk of money to a parachurch organization. The son disputed it. He argued that they coerced her and everything else. He hired a lawyer. He disputed it. He was the executor, so he sort of had control of the funds. He hired a lawyer. He disputed it. The parachurch organization hired a lawyer. Next thing you know, the legal fees run up, and so they had to settle. And the parachurch organization got quite a bit less than the, what they were supposed to get. And I think a lot of that could have been solved had mom communicated to her son. She just had one son that, hey, I'm allocating a percentage to God's work, and that's my decision. And if God's directed you to allocate more to one child versus another for whatever reason, you need to communicate that in principle to your kids and the, uh, the reason as well. If you're not comfortable doing it, I think it's best to do it while you're living, but if you're not comfortable doing it then, at least do it in a letter. Consider giving some of your assets and money to your kids. If you have a surplus that you don't really need, consider helping them out while you're alive, but be careful. Make sure you have enough for retirement. I'll deal with that in a later session. And consider doing some of your giving to the Lord's work. I'll talk about that in session, uh, session five. Prepare a letter outlining how sentimental items uh, should be distributed. That was mentioned by Kathy. And if you've loaned money, this is one area that can be sensitive. You loan money to one of your kids or grandkids, make it clear as to how this loan is going to be dealt with after you die. Because often we see cases where there's three kids, one got a loan before they died, and the other two kids are arguing that the loan that they got was part of a distribution of the estate, so they get that much less. And the kid who got the loan said, no, that was a forgivable loan. And you get into a big, big argument. So here's a summary of this session. Always seek God's wisdom and uh, God's specific direction before you make any major financial decision. Consider utilizing a trust or annuity for minor beneficiaries or for those who mismanage money. And be careful of gold diggers who do not accept an executorship or trustee position if you anticipate it's a financial mess. And do whatever you can to minimize disputes amongst your beneficiaries after you die. The Lord wants harmony amongst his family members. Tom's Financial Moments are aired on numerous radio and TV stations. For more information, check out copelandfinancialministries.org or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter under Bible Finance.